Ah, here we go.
No 
There's a crimson river flowing down the cross where Jesus died. It's flowing. It's a ball to heal the nation, a reservoir of love. I'm talking about the Savior's precious blood. We're going to do a new song. It's not a new song. It's been around, but it's new to us. Um, if you'd like to have a seat, you're more than welcome. This world is not my home I'm just a passing through My treasures are laid up Somewhere beyond the blue The angels beckon me From heaven's open door And I can't feel at home In this world anymore Oh Lord, you I have no friend like you If heaven's not my home Then Lord, what will 
Just up in glory land Well, they'll be eternally The saints on every hand Are shouting victory Their songs of sweetest praise Trail back from heaven's shore And I can't feel at home so much for all of the blessings. Thank you for the rain that we've gotten recently, dear Lord. And I, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed to say that we would love some more, dear Lord. We need it. We, it's so dry and dusty. Um, we sure would love some more rain, dear Lord. So if you could bless us with some of that, we would surely appreciate it. Dear Lord, I ask that you watch over our congregation, watch over the growth of our church, our, watch over our leaders with our church and as well as our country, dear Lord. It's no secret that we need all the help that we can get in all aspects. Dear Lord, I ask that you be with Pastor Chris today as he brings us the message. I ask that you touch everyone's heart here in a way that it needs to be touched, dear Lord. Thank you for all of the visitors that were able to join us today. And dear Lord, I ask that you have traveling mercy on everyone that did travel to church and is traveling home. I ask that you lay your hand on those who were not able to be here. They are surely missed, and I hope that they do feel how much they are loved and they are missed. Thank you, dear Lord, for our families, for our health and for all of the blessings that you've given us. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. One person in particular, Miss Kathy, would you stand up? Wait a minute, Miss Kathy, you're going to have to climb up in a chair. We still can't see you. No, we're glad, we are so blessed that you were back today. Also, uh, we normally don't recognize things like this, but this person's pretty special to the church. She gives a lot to the church of her time and, and her intelligence. But, but Miss Weslin, back in the sound booth, turns how old today? 20. So, so if you get a chance, do everything that you can do to embarrass her. I don't know if you can, but, but try. Today, we're going to finish a journey. Uh, we have been journeying to the church at Thessalonica for the last two months. And today we're going to finish that journey. If I can get this to cooperate, I don't want everybody to freeze to death now that the doors are shut. But the last eight weeks, we have covered so many things that Paul taught to the church at Thessalonica. And if you will remember, if this is your first time to visit with us or if you've been out of town or, or out of touch or, or whatever it may be, this church at Thessalonica had a, has a, had a lot in common with our church here at Wilson County. We were both at the same age. At the time that Paul wrote these letters to the church, the church was a year old. Well, we have just finished celebrating our one year anniversary. And in these letters, Paul taught truth to this church. He brought them the tools that they needed to be a successful church plant. He taught them about the love that Jesus Christ had for them. He taught them about the bad things in the world that was around them. But he taught them so much other things. He taught them prophecy. He taught them about the end times, big words that scare people like the rapture and the antichrist. And he taught them what to look for so they would know when that time was coming. 
Most importantly, he taught them true doctrine and false doctrine and how to tell them apart. So after all of this, and you may be sitting there this morning and have this same thought running through your mind. Now what? Miss Wesley, can you turn my timer on for me? Thank you, ma'am. Now what? We have learned all of this stuff. Now what do we do? Well, Paul would have one word to answer that. And it would be the same word that he would have to tell you here today he was here. He would tell the church to serve. Look at our scripture this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle while we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but in to give you, whoa, excuse me, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we come to you this morning. I pray that all of our hearts are racing. We have sung your songs. We have worshipped with you in music. And now it's time for the true worship, Lord. To open our hearts, to open our minds, to hear your word. Lord, I pray the same thing that Paul was trying to teach to this church in Thessalonica that we can take from and use today. We know that our situations are not exactly the same, but the basis of the teaching is still strong. The one thing that we can always say about Paul is Paul always taught truth. Lord, I ask you to be with us today. Let this message find the home that you sent it to find. And Lord, most of all, let us all sitting right here today do something that we none of us do enough and that's just to look at you and say I love you I love you so very much Lord we love you and we thank you and all the people together would say amen now what do we do we are a year old we've been over the hills we've been through the valley We've rode the river. We've tasted the salt. But now we look at the person sitting beside us. Say, now what do we do? We planted the church. The church is growing. Now what do we do? Paul gave an answer, and it is the same answer that he would give you today. Get busy. He would tell you to get busy. In fact, he might use this term, and I wish I could remember what movie it was from, but I can't, showing my age, my memory is slipping. But you either get busy getting busy, get busy growing, or get busy dying. But you're doing one or the other. Paul would say, you know, maybe he wouldn't use the term busy. I think he would probably say, Wilson County, get to serving. 
That is what we as Christians are supposed to do. We are supposed to serve others. And he would tell us, when you serve others, and this will be point number one, we are to serve them faithfully. Point number one. Serve faithfully. Now he told us in this letter we just read, 2 Thessalonians verses 6 and 7, Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle while we were with you. Paul wrote this not because he was some kind of hard case that thought that everybody should be working sun up, sun down for the church. This was a special situation at this church. The church at Thessalonica was young. And any time you have a young church that is full of young Christians, it is very easy to be led off the path. It is very easy to fall off the path. And I am sure that just as there as it would be here in any church in America today, a minority of the church is not doing what it should. Now, Paul would say, serve faithfully. But they were not. And the seriousness of this charge is seen in Paul's words. Paul doesn't say, hey, you need to get after it. He says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is serious. Paul takes this as serious because serving faithfully is serious. In fact, Paul says, everything that you do, you should do in the name of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? Everything that you do, not just here, but tomorrow morning when you go to work or tomorrow morning when you go wherever it may be that you're going, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Serve and serve faithfully. In fact, Paul said this is not a suggestion. This is a command. Paul wrote the church and he said, Warn those who are idle. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, but most importantly, be patient with them all. Anytime you get a gathering of Christians, you're going to have some Christians that are this far along in their walk, and you're going to have some that's literally just started walking. Well, you can't hold everybody to the same standards. I mean, you wouldn't expect someone who would just give their heart to Jesus to go and preach next week's sermon. It's just not the way it works. But we all have things that we need to do. And here he says they're idle. The church refused to work. Every church in the country could say, hey, we ought to be preaching this every week. No church has enough help. No church has enough volunteers. But these people, they were not just not volunteering at church. They weren't working at home either. They were sitting at home. And they expected the church to take care of them. Apparently this warning didn't get heeded. They just didn't want to serve. They had other things on their mind. They had somewhere else they wanted to go. You see, they weren't interested in serving because they had been suckered in with a false letter. And if y'all remember, we kind of hit on this already. They had been sent a letter by someone saying that, that he was Paul and the rapture has come. And they're like, oh no, we're still here. What does that mean? Oh, that means that we got to get to praying harder. We got to get ready we got to go. We got to be ready to go at any time. So they quit working. They quit serving. All they focused on was trying to be raptured. And Paul had told them, this is not true. You have nothing to worry about. But they still did not want to listen. So then Paul says, well, if you have talked to them and they still don't want 
to do right, then 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of worldly things. If he is guilty, if he is guilty of not serving. And when I say serving, I'm not saying serving Wilson County Cowboy Church. I'm talking about serving Jesus Christ. If that brother or that sister is not doing what they are supposed to do, then stop associating with them. We want them to come back, do this with love, but they have to understand what they're doing is wrong. Well, this church, their offense was idleness. In fact, Paul uses the term deliberate loafing. When's the last time you heard, hey, somebody's loafing? I hear that, I think about spam. I'm sorry, I don't know why. Lunch and loaf. Sorry, y'all, I just had to slide that in there. See, the problem with deliberate loafing is when you're not busy serving, then chances are you're probably interfering with someone else not ser or someone else serving. 2 Thessalonians 3.11, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. See, it's kind of human nature that if I'm not serving... But I'm going to go over here and see why they're, what they're doing. Or I'm going to go see what they're doing. And chances are I'm going to be getting in someone else's way of doing God's work. Paul says, serve faithfully. Don't expect someone to provide for your needs. Don't expect someone to be your gossip partner just because you are worried about other things. In fact, Paul says, look at our example. How did we live when we were there with you? Did you see us gossip? Did you see us loafing? We must follow his example and we must serve faithfully. But while we are serving faithfully, we must also serve well. This is point number two. Serve well. You might think in your mind, well, what's the difference? Well, let me explain to you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 9 and 10. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we are with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. The apostles would tell you to serve faithfully, but also to serve well. You can be faithful and be here every single Sunday morning. Or you could be here at every men's meeting and in every class on Wednesday night and in every work day and, and every this and every that. But if you're not doing anything, you're not serving well. It's important to be here, but it's even more important to serve well. I could just see tomorrow morning if 10 new ladies showed up to help clean, but then they just come up here and sat on the steps and watched everybody else working, that would last about 30 seconds. I know them ladies, they don't put up with that very well. I can see Sharon grinning from here. He would say, serve well. Follow the example that Paul set. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, you become an example to all the believers Paul set this example, it is common, it was normal at that time, if you were preaching, if you were planning a church, you didn't work another job. You were full-time preaching, you were full-time baptizing, whatever the church plant needed doing, that's what you were doing. And they fed you, and they put a shelter over your head, and they took care of you. But Paul said, no, you will not use this somewhere down the road and say, well, Paul's not doing nothing. He's just sitting over under a tree reading a book. He set an example for us today. 
1 Timothy 5, 18, and I love this. And I'm going to hear this the rest of the day, I'm sure. 1 Timothy 5, 18, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Now, my wife's going to call me ox all day long, probably. Of course, that's nice compared to some things she calls me. But Paul is saying when he's talking to Timothy here in this letter, if the ox is working, leave it alone. Let it work. He says the laborer deserves his wages. But see, this church chose to forego this. They said, we ain't got time to serve. We don't have time to come and, and work. We got to get ready. Paul also says, Galatians 6, 6, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. He's saying, Christians, don't expect someone to take care of you in general, but support yourself as much as you can. Paul was a tent maker. He loved to sew. He would make tents everywhere he went. The missionaries, Paul and, and Titus and Timothy, they taught the Thessalonians to be industrious. Paul is not saying quit your day job and do nothing but work at the church. In fact, his policy, he wanted everyone to listen to what he was saying. It was a firm rule. Serve well. But see, today, loafing, we don't have as, as big a problem today with loafing as they probably would have been. Today, our problem is, is we all have too much on our plate. We all have too much going on. We have so much going on, we work a job, and then we've got, uh, you know, it's, I know it's 114 degrees, but believe it or not, school's fixed to start. So it's time to start getting them deer stands ready. And next thing you know, well, you know what? They got that fishing tournament down there, so let's go get in that because it's fixing to be cold. And, you know, them Texas fish don't like cold, so they ain't going to bite. And, well, you know, we need to go to the coast before the hurricane start hitting and our trailer gets blown away. And next thing you're saying, you're like, I've got all this stuff to do. Where's my time to serve? Paul would say, serve well the church needs you to serve and I'm not just saying Wilson County Cowboy Church we need you very much so in fact if you look hanging on that wall right there I didn't get finished with it but you'll see them really cool Kathy what do you call them things you made them works for me brochures if you're interested about serving in this church Every ministry is on that wall. It will tell you about the ministry, who's in charge, who you need to talk to, those kind of things. Now, the letters for the rest of it, well, Hobby Lobby's not doing too good. I don't know when they'll get here. But it'll get here someday. The church needs you to serve, not just Wilson County, but the church in general. You serve the church every time you go into work and you sit down beside somebody and you see they're having a terrible day and you're like, you know what? Brother or sister, it ain't none of my business what's wrong, but let me pray with you. And that'll make it better. Or if you're riding along, guys, and you, and you see a, a lady on the side of the road and she's got a minivan and it looks like about 18 kids bouncing around inside it and she looks like she's fixed to have about three and she's got a flat. Her cell phone battery's dead, so she can't call anybody, and everybody's flying by so fast she's afraid to even get up and look to see which tire's flat. When you stop and you help change that tire, you are serving the church. We can't be so busy with everything that we have going on that we not serve, but we also must serve well. This church needs you. We need volunteers in here. Our little ranch hands. We've got more little kids than you can shake a stick at. We need all the teachers we can find. If you think you can even possibly teach, we need to talk to you. Not only that, our arena ministry. Did y'all know that Wilson County Cowboy Church, I'm going to announce this right now. It's been top secret till now. 
Can't tell nobody about it. Secret. October the 2nd, we're going to be hosting a ranch rodeo right out here, right out to church. It is going to be a, and of course, Doc, I should have known. This is going to be a big deal. This is not an us ranch rodeo. This is someone coming in and doing it. We're going to have somewhere between 50 and 60 cowboys that's never been here before on that Sunday morning. The rodeo is going to start at 1. He said it'll go to about 4 or 4.30. I pray by October 2nd this heat is broke. <laughs> We're even renting bleachers. You're going to be able to set up top and see it. It's going to be awesome. But we're going to need help. You know, in less than two months, our arena will be starting back up. We always need help in the arena. Did you know that we sent people to the food pantry yesterday to sort and put what, school supplies? Thank you. They say, what did we send up there? It's been a long day, y'all. We had a crew up there that did that. There will be more up there next Saturday to distribute it while we have people here working on a Connex, picking up chairs and mopping floors, getting ready to wax it. So when you come in next Sunday morning, better have your shades on. Because this floor is going to be so bright. Oh, man. Can't tell if it's the floor or did he take his hat off. We've got a lot of things going on. Coming into the fall, it's the busiest time of the year. We need help. We need you to serve. We need you to serve well. But where did Paul get this from? Why would Paul say you need to not only serve faithfully, but to serve well? Some say it comes from a Jewish proverb based on Genesis 3.19. Genesis 3.19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust will return. Some say it came from the Greeks. Some say that Paul just made it up on his own. What is clear, it doesn't matter where it came from, but Paul is telling you, you need to serve. But not only serve, but serve well. Use the gifts that God has given you to further his church. We have to serve. Here in Thessalonica, the individuals that Paul is fussing at, they're not people that couldn't work. They were just people that wouldn't. See, there's a big difference. If you can't work, that's one thing. But when you refuse, or when you go, you know what? I can make more money just sitting on my butt than if I go get a job. Paul would say, you need to get to serve. See, today, we don't have the problem of not working. Today, we have the problem we work too much. We have so much going on, we don't have time to serve well. Most of us don't even serve at all. And this points us to our last point and the most important of them all, to serve tirelessly. Paul will tell you, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Do not get tired of serving. I know how frustrating it is. I've had volunteer or group leaders come in and sit in my office and they're just at the point of tears because they do so much, but I can't get anybody to help. It's the same five or six or the same seven or eight or, or it's just me. I have to serve tirelessly. Even when you get frustrated, even when you think, you know what, maybe I just need to back away from this and I'm going to let somebody else do it, do not grow weary in doing good. Paul would tell you, you may get tired of doing what is right, but never tire. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't say that right. Hold on a second. You 
You may get, you may tire in doing what is right, but don't ever get tired of what is right. You may get tired of being that group leader. You may be tired of being that one ranch, little ranch hands teacher that's always here. You may be tired, but don't get tired of what you're doing and remember why you're doing it. You know, I couldn't, I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to teach those kids. You just look at their sweet little faces and they just look and go, I love you. I mean, we ought to have a thousand names signed up to work with our kids. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. Now such persons we commend and encourage in the Lord Jesus. Never get tired of what is right. Never get tired of serving faithfully. Never get tired of serving well. Never get tired. No one is suggesting, though, now this is important. When we go back and look at the Greek, the words that Paul used right here for doing what is right, this is the only place in the entire New Testament that this set of Greek words is used right here. He is implying that when you do not serve tirelessly, when you let what is right and you get separated, this is wrong. Because you're not just separating yourself from what is right. You're separating yourself from God the Father himself. No one is telling you to quit your job and come up here and say, I'm going to sit on the lawnmower and every time I see a grass piece shoot up, I'm going to get it. No one expects you to do that. But we ask you, please, don't use your work as an excuse. I know you're tired. I know you have lots of things to do, but remember, everybody's tired. Everybody has things that they want to do. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap. See? You can think about things that the church does. Then I ask you, remember what Jesus did. I mean, I am sure that Jesus could have found something better to do than washing 12 sets of nasty, stinking feet. And I promise you that Jesus could have found somewhere to be that didn't include spikes running through his feet and wrists and hanging on a tree. He never got tired of doing good. He never got tired of healing the sick. He never got tired of feeding the hungry. He never got tired of spreading the gospel. If he doesn't get tired, then we shouldn't either. But Paul said, whatever the loafers decide to do, the duty of the church is plain. We have to go talk to them. And see, this is one of the places where the church gets in so much trouble. Years ago, we had these things here called accountability partners. And we just, with everything that goes on, we've just kind of got away from it. And it's something that we need to get back to because each and every one of us needs to have a person that we are comfortable enough with that we can go up to or they can come to us and say, hey, preacher, you know what? You really don't need to be hanging out at that place on Friday nights. Or needs to be someone that can come to you and say, hey, you know what? You are going to burn yourself out. Don't slow down. Or whatever that it may be. It's an accountability partner. Someone that can be honest with you, tell you the truth, and most importantly, do it with love. Humans just seem like they, they just want to hunt and find that, that, pro, that good place to be mean to each other. You know, and, and maybe it's because, I mean, my wife has always said, whenever I come walking in and say, I love you, baby, and she's like, oh, crap. 
What'd you do this time? And, and maybe that's what all of us think. You know, somebody comes up and they put their arms around us and go, hey, brother, or hey, sister, you know I love you. All right, what's going on? what I do or what did you do? But we have to talk to each other with love, but we have to be honest. We have to serve and be tireless. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. How many of you here today would rather have somebody to tell you the truth and be truthful all the time or always wonder if that person is just truthful this minute and the next minute they're lying or, or, or whatever. We have to develop that in the church. We have to be able to talk to each other when we do things wrong, when we're not serving the way that we need to serve. We have to be able to accept that. Let someone come to you and say, brother or sister, we need to fix this. But we do it because we love you. We're not doing it just because we think it's fun. Spirit of love seems like we've lost that. You know, Paul, when he talked to the church, he was loving, but he was firm. He said, serve. You want to know what it is for you to do now? Serve. Serve faithfully. Serve well. Most of all, serve tirelessly. Paul would say, church, there is no excuse for not serving. You may not be able to be at every single work day or every single Monday when the church is cleaned or every single whatever. But God needs you to work in his house. He needs you to serve. And not only does he need you to serve here, he needs you to serve outside these doors. That is the thing that we have to work on here at this church more than anything. We've got to get out those doors. There are still people in Lavernia that think you have to ride a horse to come to church at the Cowboy Church. <laughs> people ask me, and I, a guy asked me in HEB two weeks ago, hey, I got a new pair of boots. I can't come to church here. I'll step in some of that horse poop and mess up my boots. What? Really? They ain't been a horse on the place in two months. Oh, well, y'all's numbers must be going down then. There's no horses involved. You drive your car, drive your truck, ride your motorcycle, hitchhike, just get there. See, the Thessalonians thought the rapture had come and they had been left. And they had to focus on trying to get back to God. But Paul said, no, you need to serve faithfully. The Thessalonians quit their job so they could be ready to go. And Paul said, no, you need to serve well. And when the Thessalonians told themselves, we're too busy getting ready to do this, Paul said, serve tirelessly. Do good because that is what we're supposed to do. He was firm about encourage one another, love each other. If someone isn't doing what's exactly right, if you know that they said, well, I was coming to that work day, but, but I had to work overtime, and they were really down at Corpus trying to reel in a barlin or something, it's okay to go up and put your arm around and say, hey, brother, we missed you. You know, we need you here. But most of all, you... Do not be afraid to serve. Do not be afraid to come and say, what can I do to further my father's church? Paul would be the first one to tell you all parts of being a good Christian are not pretty. Just like when you're a mom or a dad. We love them little heathens, but it ain't all fun and games. I still don't believe my dad when he'd whoop my butt and say, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I'd say, well, if it hurts you more than it hurts me, how are you even walking? <laughs> Wilson County Cowboy Church, we are a year old. 
What should we do now? We need to serve. We need to serve others. We need to serve faithfully. We need to serve well. And we have to serve tirelessly. Pray with me. Lord God, we come to you this morning. We are so blessed to be in a building with air conditioning, to be in a building with lights and, and PA and, and all this fancy stuff, and projectors and computers and stuff that Paul wouldn't even understand. But what we pray that we do have, Lord, is that spirit of service. That we learn from reading your scripture, that we learn from your word, from following the examples that your apostles set, that we are here to serve. And Lord, we understand that service is not always the same. No, it's awesome to be on that team that, that gets to to go out and, and preach to people and be seen and, and all that. But the service that happens behind the scenes is so important. We are so grateful for the ministry that comes and cleans your house. And we are so grateful for the men that come and fix things and for the outdoor team that comes and keeps the grass mowed. The men that give of their skills and they cook all these gobs of meat so that we can come together and eat. The wonderful volunteers that are building that next generation of servants every Sunday. Lord, I just ask you to bless all of them because they do the things they do because they love you. Lord, I pray this morning that that here this morning that someone will say, you know what, I love the Lord enough that I need to do more. I need to step up. Maybe I've always wondered what working in that arena would be like, or, or maybe I always thought about being a Sunday school teacher, or, or maybe this, or maybe that, or, or whatever it might be. I pray the Spirit enters, their, enters everyone's heart this morning. And that we realize how important today is. Because today could very well be the first day the rest of someone's life. I pray that every heart is open. I pray that every mind is open. Oh Lord, I pray that everyone here this morning tell you they haven't given their life to you. But they do that right now. Sitting in the seat right where you're at. Just look up and say, Lord, I love you. I know I'm not perfect. I don't understand half of what's been said here today. But I know that I'm here because I need to be here. And I know that I'm here because I love you. Lord, we are so blessed love you so very, very, very much. And Lord, we would ask if you could see fit. Lord. We know that your timing is perfect. Lord, we sure can. Lord, we love you. Thank you. And all the people together said, Won't you please stand with us?
Thank you once again for, co- for allowing to come in your house and study your word. Lord, I pray that we as a, as a community here in Wilson County, but also as followers of you, that we see what you have asked us to do, to go out and find and make disciples, to get closer to you. Well, I thank you again for who you are. Thank you what you are, Lord. I pray for as we go through the end of the summer into the fall that we go out and we put blessings on people to be good and faithful servants to you, not just in this building, but as we walk out these doors, as we see people that are hurting in our lives, not to be afraid to say, we need to talk. We need to talk about this guy named Jesus because He needs to be in your life. Thank you again for what you are. Thank you for what you have done. But all the thank you, Lord, for your son. Without your son, nothing else matters. And I pray. Amen. You are dismissed.